All right, what's up, social media family? What's happening? Get everybody tuned in here for a minute. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not going to be on long, but I wanted to give you guys some fruitful information um, for all of my um, executive pastor friends and uh, associate ministers, even pastors, um, church administrators, uh, executive administrators, um, everyone that's working, um, or lots of you that are working within your churches, um, whether you're full-time, part-time, bivocational, volunteer, what have you, um, I wanted to come in tonight and really just kind of give you guys some very just easy, fruitful information that would help you, um, you know, as we navigate the end of the year. It is November 16th. And so the truth is, um, if you have not already started to think about uh, next year, 2018, you're already a little bit behind the, 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 the timeline, but that's okay. That's why you're on this uh, social media video tonight, uh, whether you're on Facebook Live or Periscope, um, then we're going to try to help you out a little bit. So go ahead and invite a few people. Um, share this with people that uh, you think would benefit from this. Um, let them know that we're going to be on just for a few minutes talking about uh, church strategy, um, church planning, um, systems, and all of those kinds of things um, as it relates to um, um, as it relates to uh, to ministry. So it's going to be really fun. So um, go ahead and get your pens out, um, get your 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 paper out. Um, your calendars, your pull your notes out on your phone or devices, whatever you use to capture information. Um, matter of fact, I may do a Periscope um, or a video one day um, on the, the some of the best apps out there to capture notes. One of my favorite go-tos uh, is Evernote. So if you're not familiar with Evernote, I would invite you to check that out. Uh, I absolutely love it. I use it every single day. So go check that out. Um, so seven questions, seven questions. Uh, that your church needs to, so I did seven, right? I did it over here on Facebook Live, but Periscope only saw two, so I want to make sure y'all know I can count. <laughs> so seven, uh, seven questions, uh, seven questions that your church needs to be asking uh, at the end of the year. Um, here at our church, we've already started um, the process uh, as it relates to 2018 and beyond, uh, but more more specifically 2018. Um, I have some executive executive pastor friends. You know, I met with them in September. They were finishing the finishing their budget process for 2018 in the beginning of September. So some churches have a really early process. Some churches have uh, kind of a, a moderate process, and some churches don't think about it until the new year starts. And so uh, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge all of you uh, that are watching this or that may watch this on demand. Uh, please, 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 please set aside some time. Uh, this week is really done, and next week is, is, is a holiday week, but the, the last week of November and the balance of the time that we have in the month of December, please, um, um, <laughs> using a very old school term, govern yourselves accordingly, right? I'm going to give you these questions and give you some things to think about, and you want to pull your team together, pull your staff together, your leaders together, your volunteers together. Um, I'm available. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on social media to answer questions. Um, I do consulting with churches as well and uh, very, very excited to help assist anyone uh, that's just trying to get it right. Right. And uh, even creating resources around that as well. So here's, here's question number one, seven questions that your church needs to be asking at the end of the year. Question number one, uh, what are the greatest spiritual needs of our church and our community? What are the greatest spiritual needs of our church and our community. Um, there, there, there is a book out by uh, Simon Sinek um, called Start With Why. And I don't want to make this broadcast too long, um, but without me digging into that a whole lot, um, you need to understand that before you focus on the what, you need to focus on your why, right? Why are we doing what we're doing? Um, why has God allowed us to have a church in the city that we are uh, in? Why has God allowed for me to have the kind of members that I have? 
Um, just all of those things. Why? I mean, why has God wired me the way that he's wired me? Why is God giving me the passion, the desires, the dreams, the goals that he's given me? All of that all works in conjunction in partnership and collaboration uh, with what you're called to do and uh, who you're called to be. And so you got to understand that answer to that question. What are the greatest spiritual needs of our church and our community? Um, a lot of people, this may spook people out depending upon uh, your theological background. Uh, but I am of the persuasion that uh, spiritual warfare is real. And as a result of that, you have to understand some of the principalities and the powers and the wickedness, uh, as Ephesians 6 talks about, uh, that wars in the region, or the city, the place where you are. And if, in fact, your church is there, you are called to be a solution. You are called to be a solution uh, to those spiritual issues, those spiritual warfare realities. And so you've got to be able to answer that question. Uh, the answer to this question will determine your programming. It will determine um, your sermon series, your Bible study series, or your small group curriculums. It's going, to dis 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 going to, it's going to determine how you do your budget, where you spend your time, your emphasis, your efforts, just all of those realities. So that first question of the seven, seven questions I'm going to give you tonight, number one is spiritual needs. What are the greatest spiritual needs of our church and our community? Now, remember, uh, and maybe I shouldn't say remember because this may be new to you, but you can't reach everybody, right? It's, it's impossible for you to reach everybody. You're called to reach somebody, though. And who are those somebodies? And what are their spiritual needs? All right? Um, question number two. Question number two. What are the greatest strengths and the greatest weaknesses of our church? Now, you need to, you know, particularly if you're the pastor, the lead pastor, the senior pastor, the head honcho, you need to be emotionally mature and leadership mature enough um, to handle receiving the answers to these questions without personalizing it, right? Um, every organization, every organization that exists um, has strengths and weaknesses. A lot of that has to do with the leadership that's in place, and a lot of that has to do with the kinds of questions that are in place. Uh, another book, our our staff actually w went through this book again, uh, went through that book, rather. Uh, a lot of us had read it personally, um, but, but another book that was really incredible for us to go through this year as a staff um, was From Good to Great. And in that book, Good to Great, um, it talks about asking the hard questions, dealing with the elephants in the room, um, dealing with the brutal facts, right? And so uh, one of the things that needs to uh, be involved in this discussion uh, of what are the greatest strengths and weaknesses of our church is um, who's who's responsible for gathering the data in your church. Um, and, you know, here at our church, we have I have an executive ba executive pastor dashboard uh, that I use every single month. Um, gather that data. Um, I can report that out to our church council. Uh, I can report that out to my pastor uh, when when he would need it or ask for it. Um, I can report that out to you know our staff even uh, when necessary. Um, and notice, you know, we believe in balance, right? So data helps to inform our decisions, but numbers aren't everything. What you want to do is you want to gather the data to hear the stories behind the data. The information, the data, the numbers tell a story. So when we look at giving, it tells a story. When we look at our serving numbers, it tells a story. When we look at our attendance numbers, it tells a story. And so you want to gather those metrics and that information uh, to hear the story about your church. Uh, there's other data that you can gather as well. Um, the number of people who weren't attending any church that, uh, in the past 12 months or 12 months ago. The number of visitors that have that have attended your church, first, second, third time, that's how many we gather uh, those that data. Uh, the folks that attended the first time, second time, third time. Um, some churches gather even more than that. Some churches only gather, you know, the person that attends one time, right? Um, how are you effectively following up with those people? Uh, the number of people who came to church once but didn't return. Um, there's a big term. Um, anybody that's familiar with higher education is familiar with the term retention, right? Um, and, and colleges and universities work really hard at gathering data on retention, right? That means retaining. So if you have 100 people that are coming into your church in a month, but you're only retaining five out of a hundred, you got a you got a gap somewhere. So you need to go through and figure out how to close that gap. Um, the number of people who have invited a friend, 
um, to your church or church events. That 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 could be an important number uh, to figure out how to gather. Um, average number of connections a church member has uh, with people who aren't Christians, or the average number of connections that a person has within your church. Do they have relationships that are existing uh, within your church? I mean, there's a whole list of other numbers that you can gather. Um, you know, uh, even from a discipleship standpoint, uh, measuring the individualistic discipleship um, of your members. You know, how, how many, how many, um, how much, how much, how many scriptures have they memorized in a year? Uh, how much time do they get to spend time alone with the Lord in a day? Um, are they involved in Bible reading and Bible study? Um, encouraging them to download things like the YouVersion Bible app and getting on Bible reading plans, um, uh, utilizing things like Right Now Media and just so many other things that are there uh, that you could use to measure health, right? Um, and then serving. Uh, what are the numbers around serving? So what are the greatest strengths and weaknesses uh, of our church? What are the greatest strengths and weaknesses of our church? And you don't want to get into a pride thing here. This is not about pride. This is about looking at your numbers, looking at the information, looking at the data, and being mature enough as a leader leader uh, to take that information to to dissect it. Now, uh, let me say that, that some of this is a little bit nerdy, right? So you've got to have enough people uh, or the right people on your team, on the right seats on the bus, that don't mind being nerdy to do deep, deep, deep diving into these numbers. Um, everybody isn't wired to do that, right? But the, there's people in your church that have a passion for that. So for question number one, uh, what are the greatest spiritual needs of our church and community? Number two, what are the greatest strengths and weaknesses of our church? Question number three, what are the most significant ministry opportunities and the potential threats or barriers to our church? given the answers to the first two questions, right? So this deals with opportunities, threats, and barriers. What are the opportunities? What are the threats? What are the barriers? So you've got to be um, plugged in to paying attention to what's going on around you, right? If you are only uh, laser focused only on what's happening inside your church, then you're missing a critical opportunity to pay attention to what's going on around you. And uh, I don't have to deal with that a whole lot. And I think that one uh, kind of makes sense. Question number four. Question number four, what appears to be the most viable options for strengthening the ministry of our church? What's the low hanging fruit, right? Um, there's something that can happen in your church that you can't pay for, that you can't buy. It's a simple word called momentum, right? And I don't have time to dig into that all tonight. Um, but notice that, 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 um, that e that emotion creates motion and motion is momentum, right? So there's a whole lot of scientific stuff behind that. But as you create momentum in your church, you want to you wanna capture that momentum and utilize that momentum for as long as you can. And a part of that is also helping to take that momentum to create lasting, sustained change within your church. So how do we strengthen those things? So everything in your church either needs to be strengthened it needs to be rehabbed or it needs to be put to death, right? And you've got to be able to, to evaluate those things. Give your church, your ministries, your leaders, give them a report card, um, a progress report, if you will, to determine how well they're doing and functioning. And if a person is not functioning well, that doesn't immediately mean, immediately mean that you need to get rid of them. It may mean that they may need some coaching, some training, some discipleship, some development. And so what is our formal process of developing people? The pastor, the senior pastor, the lead pastor, uh, or the executive pastor alone can't be the only ones doing the development of discipleship. There has to become a sustained system, a sustained system that creates that. Now, I just made a major point. I hope you don't miss it. And that is that systems change behaviors. Um, some of you that may be watching this, you have incredible pastors and communicators uh, to ever preach, ever grace a pulpit or a platform. But just know you can take the greatest communicator on the planet and their sermons don't change behaviors. Systems change behaviors. Again, I don't have time to deal with all of that. I'm trying to give this to you all so that you can take this and, and give it food for thought. And then if you want to follow it with me afterwards, uh, feel free to contact me after that. Um, here's, a, here's, here's question number five. Question number five. So number one is about spiritual needs. Question number two is about strengths and weaknesses. Question number three is about opportunities, threats, and barriers. Question number four uh, is about ministry options. Question number five. What is the primary ministry flat platform on which our specific ministries should be built? There's a thing called vision and mission drift. And if you don't evaluate the language, 
the style, the look, the feel, uh, the culture, um, the cadence and the rhythm of those that are leading within your ministries, then there can be mission and vision drift. That is the vision, the mission that the pastor is communicating for the church corporately. Um, you've got groups within there, and oftentimes that's not done intentionally, um, but it's done because they, we're, not, we're not inspecting. Um, we're not setting up metrics and a rubric uh, to evaluate alignment. There is not a person who is helping uh, to monitor alignment and to make sure that the right language and the right conversations and the right training and the right development is taking place. And so uh, when you think about your statement of faith, when you think about your vision statement, your mission statement, your philosophy of ministry, um, how you list your ministries and what ministries people can plug into, if you only have ministries that people can plug into that are only uh, for Sundays, then then you're going to have you're going to have challenges. You, you got to have uh, uh, opportunities, uh, buffet, if you would, for people to plug in. And so this whole notion of vision drift is a big deal, right? The language that's used. Uh, when we have people that jump in to serve at our church, what do they need to know? What kind of lifestyle do they need to have? All of those kinds of things. As a matter of fact, uh, here at our church, we just got a new worship director. And uh, one of the things that uh, he's been working on, uh, we had an initial draft of a uh, a music arts, creative arts uh, covenant. That is everyone that sings or that helps to lead in a creative space in our church. Uh, here's a covenant that you sign, a ministry agreement, if you would, as it relates to lifestyle and, and all of those kinds of things. So uh, you want to make sure that there is a, a vision that is uh, for your church and that vision is helping to be properly distributed. How many of y'all remember that game we used to play in elementary school? Um, I forget what it was, forget what it's called, uh, but basically you got to pass the message down, right? And uh, by the time it gets to the last person, that message has gotten so jumbled up and mixed up and confused and all that stuff. And and so uh, it, it's just the nature, it's just the nature where you get get more, the more people involved, the more the message can be, can be jumbled up. So you want to make sure as a church, um, that there is not that vision drift taking place, uh, but in fact that there's vision alignment. And so you got to be very clear about your ministry platforms. Um, another example here at our church, we had 12 core values. Uh, and this year we, we felt like that that was too much. Um, sometimes as a church and as churches, we have to know uh, that less is more. Uh, sometimes we throw too much at people, right? Um, you can't feed, feed a child a steak um, and, and without them choking. And so sometimes you got to break that stuff down and simplify. Let the church say simplify. <laughs> you got to simplify stuff in order for people to be able to digest it and process it and just all of the dynamics that come along with that. And so uh, a part of what that means is, is just understanding, uh, you know, what is our core values? What is our statement of, of, of vision and statement of mission, mission statement, vision statement, all of those things. And so we, we had 12 core values and, and we, we took them down from 12 to 7. And, um, you know, that, that will make it a little bit more palatable for people uh, to process. And so, again, seven questions. Number one, spiritual needs. Number two, st strengths and weaknesses. Number three, opportunities, threats, and barriers. Number four, ministry options. Number five, ministry platform. Um, and for those that may be jumping in late on either platform, Periscope over here, Facebook Live over here, um, I'm not going to do a whole lot of review as I go through them. Just going to try to break down all the content. Uh, feel free to go back and watch this on demand. I'll try to make sure that it stays up for a while. All right. Question number six is about ministry goals. What goals is the Holy Spirit leading us to strive for to enhance our ministry over the next year and over the next two and three years? Right. So you want to think 12 months, you want to think 24 months and you want to think 36 months. There are some things in your church that you can't accomplish in 12 months. It's too much work. It's too many layers. It's too many people involved. It's too many hard conversations that, that, have, that have to be held and had. And so sometimes you've got you've to have enough wisdom. And again, this is why it's important for you to have uh, people within your church or a consultant, someone like me or other church consultants that are out there to help you think strategically about this, right? So you want to ask the question, what do I need to begin now that may take me two or three years to actually engage and put in the process, right? And so as you think through that, as you process through that, 
um, then you'll be able to put things into bite-sized chunks. And so if there's a project that you're embracing um, or getting ready to commit to, and it's actually a three-year process, then it actually makes it easier for you and your leadership team and your staff to say, okay, here's how much of this project, this three-year project, 36-month project that we want to get done in 12 months. Here's how much we want to get done in 24 months. And then by the time we get to the last leg of the 36 months, here's, you know, and then that way when you get to the 12-month mark, guess what? you will know immediately, hey, we're either on schedule, behind schedule, or ahead of schedule, right? When we get to the 24-month mark, uh, I'm behind schedule, on schedule, or above schedule, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to be able to look at those things and evaluate that. Now, here's something that's really, really important, guys. You, you really can't have 40 goals for your church in a year. That's unrealistic. Um, how do we put these things in buckets? And then, here's really important, really important point, who's responsible? Who's responsible for making sure that those goals are fulfilled? You can't just say it's on the pastor alone, right? Because the pastor is going to delegate those responsibilities to some other people as well. So you've got to think through who's responsible. And not only do they have the responsibility, but have they been empowered? Has the pastor or the executive pastor, whoever else may be in charge, the church council or the, the board of elders or, you know, whoever, have, have they created an own ramp? Um, a jetway for this person to go in to take off to make this leadership space work, right? So you got to be able to think through all of that. Culture matters. Here's the last one. So number one is about spiritual needs. Number two is about strengths and weaknesses. Number three is about opportunities, threats, and barriers. Number four is about ministry options. Number five is about ministry platform. Number six is about ministry goals. Number seven is about action steps. What action steps must we accomplish to achieve these goals? What action steps must we accomplish to achieve these goals? So you have a goal that's up here, 30,000 feet, but then what are the steps that it's going to take for us to accomplish that goal? You can't just say, here's the vision, here's the goal, without having some meat to put on that bone. You got to have some people, you know, and, and, you know, there may be pastors that are watching this or leaders, executive pastors, other people that are watching this, and you guys have great vision, right? And that's incredible. Uh, but one of the things you have to remember is, is, is that people will hear the vision but don't know, they may not know where they fit into it. And so you've got to think through, okay, if this is the step, is this, if this is the vision, the goal for 2018, then what are the five steps that it's going to take me to accomplish that? Who are the three or four people, the gatekeepers, if you would, or the other leaders or the collaboration that's got to take place? What's the collaboration that's got to take place for that goal to be accomplished? And so what I was going to say earlier is that a lot of pastors, I shouldn't say a lot, but many pastors are, are, are incredible visionaries. There are incredible visionaries, but they may not be as strong in putting the strategies around the vision that they're putting together. And there's a lot of churches that I've had contact with and, and all of those things where the pastor has incredible vision, but then the vision falls flat because the, the leadership and the pastor uh, don't, um, they don't help to put together um, a team of people that will enable them to work through the weeds. Somebody got to get into the details, work through the weeds. Um, oh man, that's my brother right there. He says, sound like this should be an ebook. I agree. You're going to have to help me put it together. And so, um, pastor, listen, it is not a knock on you as a leader. If you are not a person that's into the details, somebody has got to get into those details though, right? It is, it speaks more to your leadership when you recognize that. And then you uh, uh, empower um, other people. So we get ready to get the block ministry going over here on Periscope. Somebody asking a crazy question. That's all right. Uh, the block ministry is there. Um, it, it speaks more to your leadership, the maturity of your leadership. Um, and, and that, you know, some people may get offended at me saying that. Uh, I'm not trying to say that to be offensive. I'm just being candid and honest. Um, but it speaks to your, the credibility of your leadership when you can empower others within their gift. Everybody has their own slice of brilliance, and it is up to us as senior leaders to be able to recognize their slice of leadership and help them plug in. I think the days are gone, y'all, of just getting people to plug in to a space because we're desperate. I think the better method is, even if that means that a space has to be left undone for a period of time, 
Um, I think we've got to let people serve in their area of gifting and let them thrive there. Because here's the thing that we all have to acknowledge. When you plug a person into a space just because you needed that space filled, if that's not their passion, you actually got to do a lot more cleanup work on the back end <laughs> than you would have if you had somebody that was passionate and actually functional, functionally, functionally literate in that area that they're called to serve in. So I just wanted to give you all those seven quick questions to start thinking about that. Um, again, if you haven't started thinking about these things, you're a little bit behind uh, the time um, in terms of preparation. But guess what? You got the questions now. You can start working through it, digging into it, um, praying about it, uh, spend some time to work on that and all those kinds of things. And uh, here's a bonus point for you. Here's a bonus point for you. Um, uh, oftentimes we see in churches where we come up with a phrase or a word or a scripture that ties or that we want to use for uh, for our, I'll recap that we use for our theme for that year. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I do think that there is something wrong when churches put a theme or a scripture or a phrase together and then nothing that they do in that year connects to that theme or that phrase. So you've got to have a team of people, your staff or your leaders or your board of elders or your church council or whoever, your executive pastors or church consultants to come in and make sure that there is alignment that takes place with the theme that you announce and the activity that you produce, right? The theme that you announce and the activity that you produce. What sense does it, does it make for you to say, uh, this is going to be the year of greater, but you're not working on systems to create greater stewardship and greater discipleship or greater evangelism or greater leaders or your weekend systems are not greater or just whatever that may look like. So I'm challenging you. Come on, guys. Uh, the church is a sleeping giant in some cases, and uh, God is expecting for us to walk in excellence. Yes, strategy supports vision. So recap. Here's a recap, and then I'm getting off, getting off of here. Seven questions that your church needs to be asking um, as you get ready to close out the year. Uh, first question is, what are the greatest spiritual spiritual needs of your church or your community? Number two, what are the greatest strengths and weaknesses of our church? Number three, what are the most significant ministry opportunities for and potential threats or barriers to our church? Given the answers to the first two questions. Uh, number four, what appears to be the most valuable options for strengthening the ministry of our church? Number five, what is the primary ministry platform on which our specific ministry should be built as it relates to your statement of vision, vision, statement of faith, vision statement, mission statement, core values, et cetera, et cetera, philosophy of ministry, language, et cetera, et cetera. Question number six, what goals is the Holy Spirit leading us to strive to enhance for our church's ministry over the next year, over the next 24 months, and then over the next 36 months? And then finally, what are the action steps that we must accomplish to achieve these goals? Very basic questions uh, that you should be asking. Um, in there, I talked a little bit about the why uh, before the what. Uh, emotion creates motion, less is more, and uh, really giving you a hone in on uh, one, one thing focus, right? And so all of what that looks like, all right? Um, so if you have questions, feel free to inbox me on any of these uh, platforms. Um, if you're on a platform and you watch this somehow and it doesn't have an inbox or something like that, you can email um, us at info, I-N-F-O, at ChristopherJHarris.com. I-N-F-O at ChristopherJHarris.com. All right? Love you guys. Thank you for tuning in. Share this broadcast with some other people. It's been a great privilege and a blessing. Uh, to be able to help your ministry. I'm going to do a few more of these over the, the balance of this year. Sermon series preparation and stewardship uh, uh, things, weekend system stuff, and just a bunch of other stuff that, that we're going to share. Just kind of help make the church better and empower people uh, to help do what they need to do to make their church thrive in 2018. All right? Two fingers. Peace. Appreciate y'all.